coming from media rights agenda. And just to let you know that it took us 12 years to have the uh, Freedom of Information uh, Act passed by Nigeria and consider a country with 150 million people. It is uh, very, very uh, urgent for us to have that kind of information passed. But we want to thank the government, especially my modern minister seated here. He contributed a lot. I remember when we went to the office last time, people said it was not possible. But myself and um, media rights agenda, we said the possibility can be possible. Yes, now, right to know. To know what? My question is for my colleague from Sweden. We have 1776, I understand that's the new past. That is the American Declaration of Independence about 250 years ago. Now, if I want information for 17, 1786, 10 years later, thank you, my brother, will I be able to get it? And if I do, why, how can we test the genuineness of that uh, record? Because the typography layout of those periods is very, very different from what we have in contemporary uh, world. How do we test it? And then your document, somebody gives you a blank document, and you request for it, give another one, and it says it's not in existence. What do you do? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think let me, let me now go to this uh, team. Uh, there is a question about freedom of information and the information commissioners, even in areas where those laws have been passed and those before empowered. There is a question about media itself. Uh, editors uh, within the practice using defamation laws, etc., etc., to suppress the information and therefore probably not realize the full uh, potential of their trade. And then finally, there is this question. If we go 10 years later, to 1786, I suggest in Africa, we say, if you go even last year, <laughs> is, is, is that information available? So I'll start off with, uh, uh, with yourself. <coughs> oh, you go, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you go to me, okay. and then Umar. I, I, um, I, I wanted to address the professor from Lagos's question just initially, because I don't know if people are aware, but there's a really interesting case in the High Court in Britain about the uh, Mau Mau files, they're called, and it's about Britain's colonial legacy when they were governing Kenya. For a long time, the British government denied that they had these files. They said that they didn't exist. And it was, um, there was a lot of pressure from a reporter at the Times um, who was following that case. And uh, he called up the civil servants in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and asked them about these files and tried to get a, a, a handle on how many were missing. And it was a huge number. And it was such a huge number that it became a real embarrassment to the government that they'd somehow lost basically like several miles worth of files. Um, eventually they were, uh, because it's a court case, there are, more, um, there are more strict penalties for failing to disclose information. And eventually they were located in um, a an archive that, a sort of top secret archive which is used by the intelligence services. And now those files are starting to um, be looked through as part of this court case. So it, it, you can, when things disappear, there, there are some records management procedures you can use to try and relocate them. Um, the other thing about the commissioners, I'll just say that um, that's always been a big problem in Britain because if uh, a government wants to neuter uh, the power of a, the information commissioner, they just don't give them any money. And indeed, that's what happens in Britain, is that they've, uh, they keep their budget pretty minimal so they, so they can't investigate as many cases as the public would like. Uh, our first commissioner was not at all very good. He was very weak. We called him a toothless watchdog. Uh, the, the current one is a bit better, and certainly uh, a lot of the people that use FOI have a better relationship with him than the previous one. And, and then finally, I just wanted to talk about the, the man from Nigeria who was saying about uh, when he went up to the 16th floor. Um, I had a similar encounter on the 26th floor of uh, a building in Canary Wharf, which is the headquarters of the Olympic Delivery Authority. 
and that's where it's one of the main public government bodies that's preparing for the 2012 Olympics. And I had asked to see uh, the register of all gifts and hospitality that uh, the public servants that work there have to file. Uh, it was a long battle to try and even see that register, which is meant to be a public register available for inspection at any time. I tried to get a hard copy of it. They refused uh, and told me it would cost too much money to photocopy it, and it would take it over the cost barrier of FOI. So then I said, well, I'll come and inspect the record, which I then did on the 26th floor. Um, when I tried, I asked them if I could make copies of that record, they refused. So I had a digital camera, and I tried to take photographs of all of those. They then threatened to evict me from the building. So these things happen in, in Britain too. And, uh, yeah, I think that's pretty surprising. But, but, but what really, to me, I was the first person to ever ask to see that register, which is meant to be a public register. And uh, I, have, I teach a lot of journalism students and make them go out and do these things to request information. And they're very often the first people to ever do it. So it's all very well us talking about we need to empower other people. I think we need to empower ourselves. We need to be brave enough um, to go into these government offices and start asking uh, not legal questions, but just being a bit awkward. Very well. Thank you very much. Uh, let's hear from Neil. So I think the question has been directed to, to, to both of you. And by the way, Lida, um, you've already launched that book to me. And, uh, and even if I don't come to your function, I'm taking a copy. All right, let's go on. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, make a brief comment on, on the question here. Um, of, of course, you, ha you have a very good point here. Uh, I mean, for me as a journalist, uh, we have millions of documents that are actually available in this system. And uh, I can say from the beginning, most of the document I wouldn't understand. Uh, it's impossible. Um, what, what you need also, the first step is to get access to the information. That's the first step, but that's not the most important step. The most important step is to have skilled journalists who can uh, spend a lot of time interpreting those documents and uh, take them to certain experts uh, to, to, you know, to, uh, to get to the understanding of what's really in them and how important they are and put them in the context. Uh, this is extremely important, and uh, so the, the access to information is only the first step, I would say, uh, before you have a transparent society. Uh, and it's also a problem you know, how to find the right document in, in, among millions of documents. Uh, it's, it's not really easy, um, so I, I would say I would agree with uh, the man over here who, who said that uh, you also have to have leaks extremely important. Uh, it's much more uh, important actually because otherwise you can't use the million of documents. Very well. Omaru, media is a problem. Given half a chance they are going to suppress any information they can, they are going to use laws of defamation to say why they can't do what they need to do. Over to you. Well, yes, um, the reality is we, we, we shouldn't really um, trivialize the fact that criminal and seditious libel law is a very terrible law, and then the journalists suddenly have a reason to cite it as one of those things that inhibit the practice of their trade. Um, but that said, um, I also appreciate the fact that certain journalists do not, or media institutions do not like to be criticized. And I believe that as much as you write the right to criticize others, others also have the right to criticize you. And it's up to the, the law courts, if you feel hard done by it, to determine whether in fact you were wrongly criticized, you were lied at, and that kind of a thing. And I'm not sure whether the matter has not been taken to court in your case by the Murdoch Media outlet in Australia. But I think uh, the media is not above criticism. Now, that said, um, I just want to like to say that um, in the case of where she practices her trade in Australia, uh, probably in the same vein where Heather practices hers and where my colleague from Sweden also does practices, even the, the, the example given by my colleague from Nigeria, there have been far more serious instances. They are here giving testimony as to what they have been threatened would be done to them. But we also have instances of Norbert Zongo, for example, in Burkina Faso. He was not warned, he was killed because he was investigating information having to do with the use of public money. Cardoso in Mozambique was not warned, he was killed for the same reason. Delegiwa in Nigeria was not warned, he was killed again for the same reason. And it tells you the circumstances under which journalists operate in most of Africa. You know, but the good news is, maybe with some sense of humor, is God, if you believe in heaven, 
God will not need presidents in heaven. <laughs> you see what I mean? Because he is going to be the only president there. He will not need. He will not need soldiers because there will be no war in heaven. He will not need police officers. He will not need lawyers. No courts. The only professionals God will need in heaven is journalists because he will need to pass on his information. <laughs> <laughs> so journalists are defined very well. Um, I'm going to take. I'm going to take the last set of three questions. Um, and uh, to kick us off, we've got a little bit. And now, because of time, we are down to 10 seconds. Um, Janet Heard from the Cape Times. Just a, a suggestion, maybe after all this discussion around uh, the difficulty with pie applications, which a lot of people in South Africa have experienced, we should be looking at some kind of fund to actually get these things rolling, to actually find some way of really challenging them. With, with, with the deep pockets that we're increasingly not having. Um, but then my question is to the Swedish journalist, um, obviously your papers are, we'd all like to know when you do actually get those things, those uh, documents, but I'd like to know quickly, well, how, what process do you go through now that you, you, you've actually received a rather satisfactory um, response to your request? What, what's the next step? So what's the process, what's the next step? Uh, I'm here and then I come to you. Um, we have a lot of citizen. <laughs> we have a lot of citizens who are producing information ever through crowdsourcing, blogging, and so on and so forth. And there are growing numbers of data sets that are being produced by the public. So my question to the media houses, journalists, and investigative journalists is: Is there a movement by either U.S. individuals or media houses to work with your journalists in order to equip them with the skills that they need to extract stories from this data? and to also use this growing body of information that's been created by people so that we're not just, you know, trees falling in the forest to no one to hear us. Training, is it? Training, equipping journalists, and I'll ask uh, Kenneth to think about that as I get to uh, the next uh, question. Uh, good afternoon. Like many national and world problems, you cannot identify one single factor as the one that causes that particular problem. When we talk about the challenges of enacting and implementing freedom of information legislation, what do you think are the major factors that we must be talking about? I think you made an attempt to talk about the fact that if you're talking about freedom of information legislation, there must be many other issues that must be identified. In this case, how should this campaign be strengthened by identifying other factors that we must be talking about that make it difficult for African governments to enact and also to implement freedom of information legislation. Very good. I, I think that will still also be... Uh, uh, Kenneth, I'll ask you to, to, to mention and uh, to talk about that. I want to go there to... In Kenya we say Muzeo Akazi, <laughs> meaning uh, an elder. We're sitting here and... Uh, Thank you. Raymond <coughs> Those are not my ones. I'll try not to be an elder either. <laughs> um, uh, Nick uh, spoke about uh, the difficulties faced in this newspaper, but uh, I think he left out quite a number of, uh, of issues, uh, probably because of time. But one should recognize the fact that uh, we have um, the Protection from Harassment Bill, which is on the stocks and going through Parliament, the Protection of Personal Information Bill, which is also going through Parliament. Um, and then the, we have acts like the Anti-Terrorism Act, the National Key Points Act, the RICA Act, the Equality Act, and the Film and Publications Act, all of which encroach on journalists. But the question I want from Nick is to tell us the other aspect of his difficulties, and that is what I call legal censorship, where the courts have interdicted, interdicted the paper uh, from publishing uh, material. Uh, at the request of, obviously, a complainant. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, good question. Let me now come back to, to the uh, presenters, and I'll start with uh, Kenneth, and then Nick. Uh, and Kenneth, there's a question about training. Um, Nick, uh, the question about uh, what else is going on in South Africa. You, you, got, uh, you got it over there. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, I um, hinted on that, that uh, 
in, in, in my view, training is, is important. I think uh, uh, journalists, I, I'm a lawyer myself, I'm not a journalist, uh, but journalists